Okay, um, thanks for inviting me. I'm going to talk about systems biology, and I'm going to talk in a, more of a tutorial mode than some of the talks from this morning. And uh, it's probably going to go somewhat quickly, but if you uh, have a burning question, jump up and down, wave your hand, somehow shout out, and I'll stop and try to answer the questions. And uh, I have a lot of stuff to go over in uh, only an hour or so, but I'll try to keep you from falling asleep, um, and myself too. All right, this is uh, Chicago, uh, University of Chicago, the city. Um, this is the lab. Uh, that's where I, sp I split my time between the two places. They're about 30 miles apart. Uh, usually, I, this is what I see, though, because I'm usually flying around, and this is what it's like to land at O'Hare at night when the street lights are turned down, which is kind of cool. At Argonne, I um, run uh, uh, about a quarter of the lab. Uh, I have co all of computational research large-scale computing, environmental research, biological sciences research. And uh, as part of that, we run a large-scale uh, computing facility, one of the supercomputer centers uh, that DOE runs called Leadership Facilities. And uh, we've just been, for the last few years, running a very large Bujin P machine with about 160,000 cores. Um, a couple months ago, we uh, stood up a 10 petaflop um, Blue Gene Q machine with just about 800,000 cores. Uh, this is an interesting machine because it's um, uh, it's number three on the planetary list right now. It's number one on the green 500. It's number one on the graph 500 list. So it's very good for large scale data problems. It's very power efficient. It has a very large amount of RAM, almost a petabyte of RAM, and uh, 35 petabytes of storage. And uh, it's, but it's very expensive to operate. Um, it will, even, even though it's power efficient, um, it'll cost us about six to eight million dollars a year just to power it on. What I'm going to talk about, though, is uh, systems biology. And uh, this is the kind of facility that large scale centers that are doing genomic sequencing have. Uh, they have machines that they're, they're not quite as compactly wired up as our supercomputers are yet. This is a picture I took. Uh, last spring at, in Shenzhen, China, at the uh, BGI Institute there, formerly the Beijing Genomics Institute. And this is a small picture of about 300 Illumina genome sequencing machines that they have. And uh, just to put this in perspective for the data that's generated from these facilities, um, they have about 300 machines now. This slide's a little bit old. And uh, when these machines are running flat out, they can generate between six and 800 gigabases of sequence every 10 days, right? Almost a terabyte every 10 days. Since so they have so many of them, they're producing, I don't know, uh, 150 terabases, 200 terabases a month, or approximately a couple of petabytes a year. And that's what's flowing out of, out of these machines. They have a very large staff, about 3,000 people, of which about 50% are actually doing informatics. So they're probably a, a good measure of asymptotically what large scale biological uh, enterprises are moving towards, which is sort of 50% wet lab, 50% computing. Um, they have a 50,000 CPU cluster they use just for doing a low level data processing on the genome sequencing data that's coming off. So this is a very large scale activity. They're in the middle of a project, three year project, um, to sequence the thousand uh, most economically important plant and animal species. This is, they're doing transcript sequencing, that whole genome sequencing there. And, uh, but the whole point is to essentially provide an underlying basis for uh, understanding uh, variation and, and uh, uh, potentially uh, stock improvement, uh, diseases, and so forth, and things that actually matter to agriculture. Now, why am I interested in biology? I'm interested, I mean, I was trained as a mathematician, physicist, philosopher, uh, but I've been fascinated with biology ever since I was a kid. And, uh, some of the kinds of questions I like to think about are, uh, you know, these really big questions like, you know, are there still new life forms out there to be discovered? You know, the third branch of uh, life was only discovered about 20 years ago um, by, by people doing essentially uh, sequence analysis and discovered that uh, ribosomal sequences actually partitioned into three, tr three parts of a tree, a three-way tree as opposed to a two-way tree. Um, but we haven't really looked that, that hard at uh, life on Earth. There might be more life forms there. Um, we're trying to understand what role microbes play in climate. About 50% of the biomass on the planet is actually in microbes. It's in the soil, in the oceans. And we know very, very little about it. 
Um, we don't really understand how cells really, really work. We can't build a cell from scratch. The inventor did some clever engineering by replacing a chromosome and booting up a, a chromosome that he knew would work, but we can't do a first principle cell boot up. That would be really interesting. We don't have the engineering principles for life yet, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the kinds of things that are motivating what we're doing. And when we think about this from a, a scientific philosophy of science standpoint, um, typically a domain will go through some kind of progression, not linearly necessarily, but through these phases, a phase where we can describe phenomenon, a phase where we start to uh, build logical models that can explain things, come up with principles, concepts that explain something. Those models get good enough eventually, theory gets strong enough where you can actually make predictions and act upon those predictions. And then if you're clever enough to move from predictions to control in an engineering framework, you can start engineering things. And of course, this has happened in physical sciences over the last, you know, 1,000 years, 500 years. It's just now starting to happen in the biological sciences. Uh, we're somewhere in this kind of explain, predict section, and, and we can do a little bit of control, but not, not in a re very uh, reliable fashion. Now, there's two people that have motivated me. I mean, I never met them because they, were, they both died before I existed, um, but who, uh, whose thought I, I found very intriguing. Um, when I was an uh, early student, I was very interested in philosophy and axiomatics and logic, and I found this guy, John Henry Woodger, who was a a ah, philosopher and biologist in London in the, in the 30s. Um, and uh, he was really motivated by the positivist movement that was trying to encode, uh, you know, in an axiomatic way, all of mathematics and science and quantum mechanics and so on. And he had this grand project to axiomatize biology. And he wrote several books. Um, and here's a, I mean, in the background here, you can see some sort of first order logic expressions where he tried to encode biological principles. The problem was we hardly knew biological principles in the 30s. We didn't understand how DNA worked, we didn't understand how inheritance worked. Um, and so his principles were um, somewhat useless. I mean, this was a grand failure in some kind of technical sense, but it was inspired with the idea that if you could encode enough knowledge about biology, you could make predictions in biology by using inference. Okay, so this was one of the first kinds of knowledge engineering experiments, um, even though it was entirely done manually, but it was inspired by uh, work, you know, similar work in mathematics. The other person who I found quite interesting in thinking about these problems is von Neumann. Now, von Neumann, you know, lots of, von Neumann did lots of interesting things, but one of the things that he did near the end of his life was he worked on uh, cellular automata, right, self-replicating cellular automata. There's a book published right after he died that described uh, uh, a small self-reproducing CA that had about 471 uh, states to it and uh, elements to it. Uh, but his ultimate goal was to build a self-replicating machine, not just a logical abstraction, but an actual physical device that could reproduce itself. And uh, I, find, I, I, thought this, I think this is just a very fascinating goal, and I uh, sort of made a little map here, I mean, from back when von Neumann was working on this in the, in the 50s, um, to where we are now with uh, RepRap. Some of you probably know about RepRap, these uh, rapid, uh, you know, 3D printers where the attempt is to try to print as much of the material needed to reproduce a copy of a 3D printer, right? So here's a 3D printer, as a Mendel, and here's the components that it's able to print, which is a significant fraction of what's needed to actually build a copy. Now, it doesn't have the robotics, it can't make the metal parts and so on, but this is a step in that direction, and I think it's, it's really fascinating. Um, now, if we think about biology, you know, we know that biology is a bit different than physical sciences, and trying to get at exactly what makes it different is uh, a bit of a challenge. Um, Ernst Mayer uh, thought a lot about this and wrote uh, a fair amount about, uh, the, the, about this difference between physical sciences and biology, and he came up with this concept he called dual causality, which I'm not sure I agree with, but um, where he talks about biology is more than physics because biologic, biological systems have animate processes that are executing genetic programs that have a huge amount of historical context embedded in those genetic programs. And while they have to follow all the physical laws, they can't violate those, they have to do more than that. 
Um, and when you're studying biological systems, it turns out that they're fundamentally data rich because of that historical component to their genetic programs and the fact that there's an unbroken chain of existence in biological entities that goes back about three and a half billion years. And that, that uh, historical context is what makes everything possible today. So you can't really study a, bio, a lot biological system easily, at least a natural one, outside of the context of that evolutionary framework. If you start building large collections of these biological entities, then you have to deal with higher order things like ecological and social and economic uh, principles that, again, don't exist in the physical world necessarily. Um, so this is sort of interesting of a progression, and I think that um, it's this inherent notion that genetic programs are behind biological systems and that they're data rich in their, in their existence means that studying biology is actually different because it's a data rich uh, environment. Now here's the classical uh, picture of a biological system, the central dogma that you would study in, in high school and, and so on. Um, and I'm gonna describe quickly through this where we are in terms of uh, the, the technology for uh, reverse engineering systems that behave like this and the data requirements that are coming from it and sort of the algorithms and sort of how, to, how we think about that. So at the top, we've got DNA. That's, of course, a storage molecule. can very efficiently store information. Um, DNA is transcribed into an RNA, another molecule that can store information in sh relatively short segments. That's translated into uh, proteins or peptide sequences, which build little machines that actually do the work. Okay, so there's a feedback loop there. Those proteins or peptides produce complex circuitries, networks that actually carry out biochemical functions, regulatory functions, uh, signaling functions. And it's the combined effect of all of the uh, elements of these circuits that produce the phenotype, the observed thing that we look at, the trait in a, in a plant or a color in a flower or the texture of your hair or the metabolic potential of a microbe is all the result of a large collection of entities cooperating in a network to achieve that. Now, on the right, um, we talk a little bit about what technologies we can use. Where we, we can sequence DNA. We can read DNA relatively easily now. It's very inexpensive. Um, we can use uh, various technologies to capture transcripts in action. One of the technologies we can use for that is actually DNA sequencing. Uh, for example, sequencing what amounts to the complement of the RNA and that gives us a snapshot of what genes are actually being expressed at any given moment in the cell. We can use proteomics to take a snapshot of what proteins are actually present in the cell at a moment, in, in, a, in a given window of time. We can use metabolomics, using mass spec and so on, to look at the abundance of small molecules that are present in a cell or a piece of tissue at, at some fixed period of time. And so by taking these snapshots on the right, we can piece together an information framework that allows us to reconstruct the state of the cell. Now, of course, the cell doesn't, doesn't exist in isolation. It's being infected by an environment. Um, and of course, the information content in the DNA is the thing that connects it back, backwards in time to all of its ancestors, right? So understanding how the, you know, how the information is structured up there is actually an evolutionary question as well as a physical question. Now, if we look at, uh, you know, right today, how much data do we have uh, in the largest collections of data um, that, we, that we've built, the community's built, for studying biological systems. So I'm gonna focus here on prokaryotes only. These are microbes, you know, single cell organisms that do not have a nucleus. These are the most abundant ones, the ones that you know, make up a couple of kilograms in your gut. They're 10 times the number of cells in your body than human cells, and you know, about 100 times the amount of genomic information. Right now, we have about 40,000 genomes that have been sequenced of microbes. About 5,000 of them are public, and about another 35,000 are actually private, haven't yet been released. The actual uh, information content in those genomes is relatively small, say 40 gigabytes for that entire set. That's no big deal. But what's happening is that right now, people are sequencing not a single organism at a time, but hundreds of organisms at a time, partly because it's so cheap. The machines can do so much sequencing that, in fact, not cost effective to sequence a single microbe. It's cost effective maybe to sequence 100 or 300 at a time, right? So projects now are sequencing 100 genomes at a shot. They might be 100 different variations of some organism, right? 100 different strains of some infectious disease organism or 100 different uh, 
uh, mutants that they've produced in the laboratory, the raw output of a sequencer of capturing those 100 genomes is going to be about 100 gigabases per, uh, per project. And there are thousands of projects that are in the pipelines for doing that. So over the next few years, the raw data that's, in, that's sort of inputting at the front of this pipeline is going to be approaching about a petabyte. And that's for PROCs alone. Eukaryotic genomes, humans, plants, mice, you know, things like that, are somewhere between 10 and 100 times that size in the scale of their genomes, but we're not doing nearly as many projects on those. So they're going to trail behind in terms of total amount of data. If you look at gene expression, right, what, right now we have a, a gene expression data sets for about 1,000 uh, organisms and uh, in some cases a few hundred states. And again, each one of those, uh, each condition, I mean, ideally what you'd want is for a single genome, about 1,000 conditions, you're sampling now the network in different states, and you're going to use that to reconstruct the structure of the network. Um, each one of those conditions takes about 200 megabytes to represent that. And uh, so if you took all the 1,000 uh, genomes that you'd like to have, a subset of the 40,000 that we have, you'd probably end up with maybe 200 terabytes in the next couple of years from doing that. And then the metabolomics and proteomics side, where you're doing mass spec, of course, the raw data in mass spec can be very large, but at the end of the day, you know, again, you've got maybe 1,000 organisms you want to sample the space, you want to do about 1,000 conditions, more or less the same conditions up above, and you, know, you want to get snapshots of the abundance of these proteins and abundance of the metabolites, and that's going to be, going to be on the order of a petabyte. So in the next couple of years, in the microbial space, we're looking at a few petabytes of data, okay? And the typical group is working with much less than that, all right, maybe a terabyte or so. Now, the program that, that I'm sort of pursuing in our group and, and with lots of uh, collaborators and so on is this notion, the systems biology of essentially environmental organisms. And what we're interested in is going from the genome to recovering the networks to recovering the phenotype of the cells to now understanding the variation in a population that is all the properties of these cells have, are, you know, have, have, uh, uh, are related to the, um, you know, single nucleotide polymorphisms or genetic variation in the genome. And so a population of, say, a million cells is not going to have a million identical entities. It's going to have a million entities, each of which has some subtle variation. And so you're going to have Gaussians in sort of every feature. You can think of it that way. So we're interested in sort of the amount of variation in a population. We're interested in how these populations assemble into communities of many different types. The upper right one is a Winogradsky column that you can make in your kitchen to entertain your kids. It has a couple uh, dozen species of bacteria naturally occurring in soil. They differentiate vertically because of the amount of oxygen that diffuses from the top to the bottom. And so you can create a, a, a gradient. And uh, you'll get interesting colors, which entertains the little kids, and more interesting things. And it smells wonderful when you open it. Um, and then uh, on the bottom, you have things like hot springs that have thousands of species interacting um, across very tiny chemical and thermal gradients. And of course, that's the really interesting natural systems that evolved. And so we're interested in pushing the technology through this uh, set of hierarchies to where we can say something meaningful about the community and the right uh, all the way back to the genome. All right, so we have a project, well, I'll talk a little bit in a minute, I don't have a lot of time to talk about it, called the, the Knowledge Base, DOE Systems Biology Knowledge Base Project, DOE Systems Biology Knowledge Base, also called K-Base. It was just launched last year, and I'll talk a little bit about that. One of the things it's doing is building an integrated data and knowledge environment to allow us to advance state-of-the-art in modeling systems biology problems in uh, microbes, communities, and the environment. And the way we think about this is we're building an environment to allow us to explore a series of models. Now, why am I talking about models when this is some data about me, uh, a meeting about data? Essentially, the reason we're collecting data is to understand what's happening. The way we understand what's happening is by trying to build a model that allows us to make predictions and to test those predictions, right? So the model's at the heart of this. And of course, theory is at the heart of, of sitting behind these models. We think about three different kinds of models. Uh, mechanistic models that have a one-to-one -one correspondence to some biological entity, sort of functional models that are more abstract, that relate an input to an output, and generic models that are high-level abstract models that are applied to lots of different phenomena, and then high-level conceptual things that um, are ideas that are sort of unique to biology. So if we 
map things. For, over here, we might talk about protein complexes, active sites, ion channels, membrane dynamics. Here we have things like uh, biochemical networks or regulatory networks or just the high-level relationship between a genotype and a phenotype. Over here, we might have things like predator-prey models, which could apply all over the place. Principles like selection and so on, and then up here, things like the notion of a species is a concept that we have to now make consistent with all of this. So this is sort of the, the theoretical f or modeling framework that we're trying to enable. Now, over the last 20 years, since the first genomes were sequenced, there's been a large community of people building integrated biological databases and linking that to a set of bioinformatics tools. And this is what most bioinformatics groups work on. They work on a tool here. They might work on some uh, technology for integrating in a database. Usually these databases are relational or maybe now a little bit, you know, no SQL type databases or even flat file kind of databases. And people build integrated environments that might have a dozen tools that allow you to sort of integrate something, compute, reintegrate it. And if you're lucky, you can make some predictions out of here that then drive some experimental design. Okay? Um, and of course, we're moving towards high throughput experiments, and you want to integrate that data back in. So this creates somewhat of a feedback loop. And a few years ago, if you ask people, how is this working? Well, they say it's working pretty well. We've got sequencing at the bottom that's giving us assembled genomes, and people are devising new ways of building on top of sequencing data to predict higher level principles. Okay, and, and more ideas about how you can uh, leverage that to do things like, you know, single transduction pathways. And computing is needed to actually integrate this and drive experiments. Um, so there's this kind of symbiotic relationship between the sequencing, the computing, and driving future experiments. And this has been working fairly well, but if you're a sort of a computational person, you look at this, you say, well, what's missing in here is the modeling. What's missing is the simulation. What's missing is the ability to make any kind of prediction that's more meaningful than just a, uh, an assertion, a logical assertion about relationship and data. All right. So we've been thinking about how to advance theory and biology at the highest level, or the, the agenda I talked about, and what do we need to build to do that as a computer scientist? Well, we want to build an environment that would contain all the observations, hypotheses, and experimental results relevant to the problem or a set of problems. We need methods to classify, organize, and integrate this data. Okay, sounds pretty generic. We have to be able to search it, query, analyze, compare, annotate. I'll come back to that. This is kind of a clever thing in biology. And update the data. This is a big problem because data is flowing in continuously. From this, we want to be able to build models, design experiments, make predictions, or you know, projections, simulate as needed, compare these models um, derived from the data and produce updated models, take experimental data, reconcile that, look at enough of these things to try to synthesize new principles, right, and give us a bigger drive here, and ultimately do all of this in some framework that allows you to collaborate, because this is not something one person does or one lab or even one university or one company. It's, it's a whole community effort with, you know, tens of thousands of people. Right. So this is really what we're trying to do from an infrastructure standpoint, and the algorithms um, that I'll hint at in here are underneath, you know, like when I say compare, I mean, you might have hundreds of ways of doing that, right? So one of the things that you're head around is how big is the data? Now, I don't mean the size of it, we talked about that, but the complexity or the practical complexity of where is it coming from. In 2001, when we started this, there was about 300 biological databases out on the internet. Today, in 2011, there's over 1,000. All right, these statistics were from 2001. Um, so in 10 years, basically, the number of databases increased by a factor of three. The amount of data increased maybe by a factor of 100 overall in that time frame. These databases have relationships to each other. Here's a, just a snapshot showing you that, you know, they're not redundant. They're uh, complementary in most cases. I'm going to talk about annotation for a second. So um, somewhat unique to biological sequence data is this concept of annotating it, of actually assigning notes essentially to features in otherwise featureless data, right, that allows us to uh, associate what we know about that sequence. And this process of annotation involves taking the sequence, parsing it, recognizing features, doing comparative analysis, 
in what we've already seen before to assign by, by analogy uh, functionality uh, to these features uh, and then uh, use those, the, that as a map essentially of, of what we've seen, right? And the most common way to do this is computationally. Um, now is so, so large scale, and I'll talk about how we've automated a whole bunch of this, but ultimately we want to apply annotation to things beyond sequence um, at these higher level functions. So you, know, you start with sequence over here, um, you have an, a primary structural annotation which is sort of parsing the genome out, take it into biological components, we assign names and functions to these things, put them in some context, how they function together. Um, we can then do these things as a network that is a two-dimensional matrix of these things and how they interact with each other. We can translate that into structure in some cases, not yet all of it, um, and, and eventually we want to translate this into time. So annotation goes from this kind of linear thing uh, to a time-dependent set of models associated with objects. Now we started building a system back in 2001 that was aimed at this kind of a structure. It would start with genomes and it would end up with phenotype predictions. That, chart I showed at the beginning, right, which starts with, with the DNA sequence and ends up with what can we say about the functional properties of this organism, right? What can it grow on? What does it do? What's the biochemistry it can carry out? And this is essentially the steps we have to go through. We have to annotate it. We have to do comparative analysis. We have to map the entities that we understand into their, into reactions, say, or some kind of logical reactions do a mathematical abstraction of that into something like a stoichiometric matrix in the case of metabolism, uh, produce models, network models, network flow models, and then compute on those models, say, to do computational experiments, like what happens if we delete a gene? Can the organism still grow, or can it still produce uh, this particular output uh, at the same level, right? And there's all kinds of related analysis that you can do once you have certain capabilities. And we've, we've now built this pipeline. About three years ago, we got this working, and we've now run it on about 3,000 genomes where we have functional predictive models of their metabolic phenotype. Now, I'm just going to, I'm not going to go through this in detail because I don't have time, but I'm just giving you a sense of how this works. This is what we call the RAST workflow, the Rapid Annotation through Subsystems Technology, which in this diagram here is essentially this first step right here. And it's a workflow takes in genomes, it predicts the open reading frame using uh, patterns that we've seen before, um, that we can understand the beginning of a gene, the end of a gene. Um, it finds a set of genes that we uh, believe are very highly occurring, so-called universal genes, housekeeping genes, there's a couple hundred in most organisms. We use that to create a phylogenetic neighborhood, an evolutionary neighborhood of where we think this organism sits, and then we can look at its neighbors to identify um, uh, genes we would expect to see in that organism, and so we look first for the things we would expect to see, um, and for the things that we uh, don't identify in that first look, then we do a much more computationally intensive process of, uh, of looking for things that, that we haven't seen before. And as the end of this, we end up with an annotated genome. This takes about, for a small genome, maybe a few minutes with the current technology now. It used to take, you know, weeks to do this. Now we can do it in a few minutes. Um, and these annotations now are quite good. They're about as good as uh, you would get by a graduate student working on it for a year. Okay. Now, under, underneath this is a set of databases. This is a, a high-level uh, summary schema of a couple of databases to support that pipeline I, I mentioned. The one over here called the SEED is used for annotation and curation of the an of annotations. And this is sort of a high-level entity relationship diagram showing the, the entities and the relationships between those entities. So we have a DNA sequence and a feature and a functional role and a subsystem, which is a collection of related functional roles and, and so forth. These things map into uh, gene protein reaction associations, which then give us a reaction, which relates to compounds, which gives us some metabolic models. So we can go from a sequence all the way to a metabolic model predicting output, say, in a, in a chemical network. And these are some statistics of, of what's there. Now in these systems, um, some, if you go out on, your, on the web right now and look and Google for PubSeed, you'll find the public entry page for, for this system right here, and you can browse about 3,000 genomes that are in there, 1,000 collect curated subsystems that cover about 14,000 of these curated roles. And each of these have been curated by a human. And the reason for that 
is that we're computationally projecting these roles across many thousands of organisms. And so the basis on which we uh, structure that projection has to be as accurate as we can, otherwise we're propagating noise, right? So this is a key step in most systems like this where there's a set of, of humans behind making functional, uh, uh, functional curation decisions. Then the model seed is the engine that's actually producing models uh, uh, from the output of this uh, first stage here. And right now, we've produced over 3,000 models um, of all the public uh, genomes that are available. Some of these are, are good models, some are less good. And people then take those models and start to uh, build on them. There's also another 10,000 private models that have been constructed on genomes that haven't been released. What was very interesting as a side effect of building these systems and making them publicly available, they're free, they're, we've got thousands of users, is that we discovered that only about 10% of the data is actually being released publicly. In spite of what's required by NSF or NIH or whatever, there's still about 10 times the amount of data that's actually being uploaded and annotated in our systems that is not yet in the public archives. And that gap is increasing uh, between the, what's public and what's actually private. Um, that's sort of an interesting you know, philosophical problem. This is the pipeline that's used. Again, I won't go through it. Uh, if, you want, if you're curious about this, I'm happy to, after the talk or break, whatever, explain you know, how this works. Um, but you go from this annotation step. Um, we create these uh, pathway fragments. They're glued together. There's a thing called um, gap filling, which essentially uh, uses constrained optimization algorithms to choose the smallest number of additional reactions we have to add to a partially reconstructed network to complete the network. Um, and this is an attempt by, by us to have a sort of Occam's razor kind of approach to the idea of filling in for the unknowns. And each of those posited reactions now becomes a testable hypothesis. Does a gene exist in the organism that actually codes for that reaction? Or, or, is, or is that, uh, you know, are we being too, too simple? Um, the best organisms right now out of uh, maybe a network that's going to have about uh, 1,500 genes are probably gap filling about 100 genes in that. The worst ones are probably gap filling two or 300 uh, reactions out of that. When you go through this, and we, ha and we all have other algorithms in here for uh, essentially driving the networks to be consistent with experimental data, particularly growth data or, or uh, expression data, for the best uh, cases where we have that data, we can get uh, automated models. It takes about 24 hours to go through this. And, uh, for a typical organism um, that are approaching 90% accuracy in terms of predicting growth conditions and predicting gene essentiality. Doing that automatically for thousands of organisms uh, has been just a blast. I mean, it's just, this was impossible you know, a couple years ago. Right. This is uh, what goes into the, database, the biochemistry databases. So um, I'm going to go through this. Um, one of the things that we've done in the process is built an environment that allows us to um, write very simple scripts that can do uh, very complex workflows um, in our environment. So for example, if we want to identify trends in gene expression, we can write a script that only needs about six functions here to actually uh, create uh, a histogram of a relationship of the number of roles and the fraction of data sets where that role has been expressed. This is something that, again, has been impossible to do uh, up until recently because this data would have been scattered in many archives. Uh, you had no way to actually compare data from different methods and so on. I won't go through these. Uh, this is, well, this is sort of fun, actually. Identifying genes for candidates for gaps. I talked about this idea of gap filling in these metabolic network reconstructions. Of course, as, a, as an experimentalist, what you'd want is the system to tell you, I think the organism has these 14 functions but they're not currently in the data, you know, they're not currently annotated in the genome. Look for them, and if you find them, you've got a paper, right? And it's a paper you can get in a week or whatever, right? This is the script. It's, a, it's a, essentially a six-line script that can do that now for a 1,000 organisms or more, right? So we've, we can generate hundreds and hundreds of hypotheses a day with this environment. And what we need, of course, is an automated lab on the back end to actually uh, do that. Okay. So let me give you a little bit of a, a snapshot of, of uh, for those who are paying attention. So this is an organism. I'm talking about an organism that's one of my favorites. This is an organism called Buchnera. It's a really tiny guy. This is about half of a micron here. It's, it's an endosymbiont. It lives inside the gut of a uh, aphid. Aphids are these little green 
things that live on plants that sometimes are farmed by ants, right? They live on uh, plant juice, essentially. They're like cows for ants. Um, and they co-evolved with bacteria over about 140 million years, and they've evolved these special cells, special aphid cells called bacteriocytes that, whose only function is to provide a home for this bacteria. And this bacteria's function in this organism is to carry out metabolic reactions, biochemistry, that the organism itself can't do. Okay? It lives on a very nutrient deficient uh, material, and so it can't synthesize its own uh, amino acids, and so it needs the bacteria in order to synthesize the amino acids. Okay? The cool thing about this is this, this uh, cell is a very, very simple reduced organism. It's distantly related to E. coli that's in all of our guts. Okay, we all have about a kilogram of E. coli in ourselves. A long time ago, 140 million years ago, they had a common ancestor. Right? The one that went in here over time has lost 90% of its genes. Okay? Um, and we, there's many strains of this. We've sequenced every subspecies of an aphid has a subspecies of Buchnera, okay, they co-evolved, right? This is what it looks like the first few thousand base pairs, right? You stare at this, you know, you don't see anything. Well, you see some letters. Um, I talked about RAS. You could upload this to RAS. It would uh, run it through the automated pipeline and it would come back with something like this. This, this is a, I love this when teaching my computer science students because it's a genome that fits on one page, just like a perfect, you know, function, right? Um, and uh, so it's about 600 genes, okay? It's about 600 kilobases. And uh, I'm gonna zoom on this piece at the beginning here just to give you a sense how this works. These are color-coded based on function, okay? And the green ones are um, uh, related to uh, uh, energy metabolism, okay? And you can see here little patterns. They occur in clusters, right? This idea of clustering on the chromosome in single-celled prokaryotic organisms is very common because it means that those genes typically have a related function, and as the genes are transcribed off the DNA, they're transcribed together so that they're, all the necessary parts are together at the same time. They assemble into the protein machinery in the right ratios, and they're all together at the same time, right? So this little piece here, I'm gonna explode just so you can see what it is. This is a piece for ATP synthesis. It has a, I think eight different parts here, or, yeah, eight parts. And it's gonna code for a little uh, machine looks like this, embeds itself in a membrane, and uh, it uses a uh, proton gradient to uh, synthesize uh, ATP uh, from ADP. And uh, this is well studied. It occurs in every single one of our cells in huge numbers. It's in mito mitochondria, that's right. It's what basically uh, provides energy for the cell. Uh, and it's conserved across, you know, basically uh, almost every single organism that we've ever uh, found has uh, this kind of a structure in it. And this thing has been, has been uh, used by evolution over time to produce other structures, right? Evolution works uh, sort of like, uh, you know, Mythbusters. They always go to the junkyard to find some parts to build something. They never really build something from scratch. Um, so here's a, uh, I don't, Sometimes my movies work, sometimes they won't, but these are some animations of how this thing works. It's been well studied by people who like to build uh, uh, computational models because it has sort of a rotating cam action to do it, but it occurs in mitochondria, chloroplasts, bacteria. A version of this occurs in uh, uh, eukaryotic mammalian cells. It has two parts, a part that uh, sits in the membrane and a part that uh, rotates, and these actually occur in, uh, uh, together on the chromosome. And we can look at... Uh, uh, one of the things we can do with the system is we can compare the occurrence pattern of these on the chromosome across many different organisms. And we can see some organisms where they occur in different locations on the chromosome, where the, for, for some reason evolution has partitioned that structure into two parts and it assembles them separately, perhaps in different ratios for different functions. This is you know, one thing you can see when you build this. You can do detailed analysis of, of say, pick one of those subunits and that structure and do multiple sequence alignment. These are, uh, you know, formally is an is a MP complete kind of problem, but we have approximate algorithms that work okay for identifying, uh, you know, likely uh, regions that are similar and gaps, and you can sort of see where evolution has made changes uh, between them. We can look at uh, how these clusters on the chromosome relate against different organisms. These are some of the kinds of things that one does. 
Here's a uh, picture of related structures that uh, we're not sure of this, but we think uh, that some of the underlying building, comp building blocks for these structures actually evolved from ATP synthase. This is the flagellum that provides motility for a lot of organisms. These are uh, more nefarious structures. Um, these are secretion systems that um, are used in pathogens to inject bacterial uh, peptides into eukaryotic cells, like uh, the you know, infectious organism will get into a human, get next to a eukaryotic cell, wants to disrupt that cell's uh, function. It uses this tiny needle to inject in the, this is the eukaryotic cell membrane here, creates a channel. The reason that channel is, is interesting is because in the flagellar system here, this thing is built inside out. The parts flow up here and then attach on the inside. So this thing is hollow in the middle. That hollowness has been reused by evolution to build these hypodermic syringes that are used to attack eukaryotic cells. Very clever. Now, okay, so back to the uh, system. So we've, we've built several of these systems, RAS, SEED, MGRAS, model seed, four of these that we've built. These are groups at Berkeley we collaborate with, JGI. Together we have about a user community of about 20,000 users. Um, now, we've been doing this for a long time, it's been doing this, and when we started this knowledge base project, we decided to try to add this component to this picture, which is to go from uh, bioinformatics analysis against the integrated data to now building uh, what amounts to a simulation pipeline uh, to drive models, right? And so for, an exper for something that we can predict like metabolism, we build a metabolic model, we predict, say, the effects of gene knockouts, and then we want to do the corresponding experiment and then reconcile those two things. So this system we're building, it's called the Knowledge Base. It's a project that's been going for about a year. Um, it's building infrastructure for microbes, microbial communities, and for plants. These are things that DOE cares about. They're, they're not pathogens. They're not biomedical uh, things. Um, we're trying to support workflows like this, where you want to, say, engineer a microbe to have better throughput in producing precursors for a biofuel. To do that, you have to do something like this, annotate the genome, reconstruct the the metabolic network, build a model, uh, reconstruct the regulatory network that's providing control on that network, um, get some snapshots of other functions like metabolism that's happening there. We've got kinetics data. We want to uh, put that into the model. We want to now predict under different conditions which flux patterns would exist in the organism and then propose optimizing the strain that is by deleting genes or adding genes, adding cassettes, to actually modify the output of that organism uh, for, for some purpose that we have, right? And then compare that against experimental data. So this is what you, a typical scenario workflow, and it needs about a dozen tools in that pathway to do that. Um, and we're building the integration to support that and, and, and the database on uh, which to um, build it. Uh, in plants, you might want to do a similar thing for, say, magnifying lignin. Plants are very much more complicated than these microbes, but one of the fundamental problems in plants for biofuel is plants have cell walls that are made out of cellulose, which is relatively easy to digest into sugars, which you can then produce into things like alcohol or butanol or so on, and lignin, which is a very much difficult to uh, digest compound, carbon compound, that acts sort of like rebar. Think of this as like concrete. Cellulose is like concrete and lignin is like rebar, right? So together they're very strong, but the rebar is really hard to digest. And so if you want to build an ideal plant for biofuel, you want it to be just strong enough to do whatever you want it to do and then have as little lignin as possible to make it easy to digest. To do that kind of analysis in plants, you introduce a couple more steps that we don't have in the other one. One of them is to do a genome-wide correlation analysis or genome-wide associativity study that tries to correlate single changes in the genome with phenotype variation and do this in a statistical way that gives you some clue about where in the genome you might want to make a change that would affect, say, the, uh, frequent, the amount of lignin in a cell wall. That's a very large-scale computation to do that. We also have projects to uh, work out how to culture organisms that are unculturable. I won't talk about that. Um, and how to build models of, of, of things like very complex environments like soil that have like, you know, 10,000 species in them, which is a work in progress. Okay, so we're building a system that has to provide a lot of capabilities beyond what people have. We have a crazy model that we want users to actually be able to use this thing. Um, you know, 
put yourself in the pilot seat there. Um, we want to leverage what the community's already been using. We started out, well, let me go back for a second. So we built all these tools over the last 10 years. Now we have this project sitting on top of this, and we originally started out with the idea we were just gonna expose these things via web services and have sort of a federated model. And we started down that path and decided that that was not gonna work, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, here's a typical workflow that we wanna build. I, I, you know, the cartoon version of it for that first microbial one, this is the actual instantiation of that in reality, right? And you've got red things here are computational steps, okay? Calling the genes, model reconstruction, gap filling, flux analysis, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the letters here represent which system that functionality currently exists in in our existing collection of systems where users have to interact with it. And of course, what we're trying to facilitate is making this a single integrated capability that thousands of users can use sitting on top of 10,000 genomes, right? So we started out with, down this kind of federation path listening to all of our web services friends telling us all the wrong stuff, essentially. Um, and we, you know, we can make that work, but we started realizing we had to build what amounts to an extensive caching layer in here because the, one of the fundamental problems in this kind of an architecture is the ontologies or the namespace, if you think of it that way, in each of these systems has to be ultimately reconciled in order to actually do computing on it. And that reconciliation is a heavyweight process. You cannot do it on the, you can do it on the fly, it's just very inefficient. So what we decided was to move away from this model to create a, a persistent data layer up here where we essentially import data and functionality from these systems, upload it into here to a more, much more centralized model. Let me show you. So we had, we had to uh, create an environment that has three different types of data stores. The thing we call the CDM, this is relational. It's built on top of technology like MySQL. It's heavyweight from a change management standpoint. It's heavily curated. It's, it's, we've got a gatekeeper function on it. Uh, it's got a very complex uh, schema that's completely uh, driven from a high-level ER diagram. Um, and this is for structured data, um, and it's highly curated. We have a, another technology that we're building for uh, bulk file storage that has petabytes of raw data. So the raw genome reads, for example, in a metagenome or the ver reads that you might do in plant genotyping are sitting over here. And then a persistent store, which is much more flexible. This is a NoSQL thing built on Mongo um, that scales up. Each user that logs into the system gets a persistent workspace and they can project data from here into here, compute on it, uh, access data from here. And this is, uh, allows us to map the relational structure as needed, but also to do other things more flexibly, still have typed objects. And then when things get promoted to be public, we can push them out of here, okay? Then we're building an API on top of this. Um, let me just zoom forward here. The overall system is, a, is built on a system, on a uh, service-oriented architecture, which means that we have hundreds of internal functions in this system. They're implemented by a series of servers. Each server has a compact set of functions that it supports and access to the data that it needs, uh, typically remotely to the database. And we can then scale the system by adding additional services or additional servers for each class of service. So the genomic servers that might be doing, say, annotation, we have a big annotation load. We just create more replicas of that service, and we don't have to necessarily scale everything else out. So this is a strategy that's actually working quite well for us. Um, just to give you a sense, these are this is a snapshot of uh, just a small fraction of the API. Uh, this is a Perl instantiation of it that you can run from the command line. If you're really interested in this, I can show you how to download you know, the entire kit on your laptop and experiment with it. Um, we have complex workflows that we're running on top of this to test all of the different uh, execution paths. Um, let me show you, you know, one of them, say if you're looking for horizontal gene transfer, you know, one thing that has become clear in the last 20 years or so is that particularly in microbes, they're very promiscuous in terms of passing genes to each other, right? So all the sort of 1,000 different kinds of microbes inside your body, they, you know, the ones that outnumber your cells by 10 to 1, um, they're passing genes between each other all the time. This is how uh, antibiotic resistance moved from, you know, cows, from the gut flora in cows, they're fed continuous streams of antibiotics into organisms that then end up in people that confer antibiotic uh, resistance. 
One thing we're interested in is trying to reconstruct the history of horizontal gene transfer in these organisms because we're trying to understand um, how to make sense out of the relationship, the evolutionary relationship of these genes. A workflow to do that right here, I won't go through it, but this is something that if you wrote this down in our environment um, and try to execute it, you, you could. Um, it would probably run, depending on how, much, how many processors you could run uh, it on, might run for a week or a month. Um, but it would essentially compute an evolutionary tree for every, every protein family and then reconcile those trees with the organismal evolutionary tree. And when you were done, you would get a picture that looks something like this, where the organismal tree is this sort of gray box here. This is our expected uh, relationship between the organisms with the leaves here and the uh, putative ancestors. And these uh, rainbow lines here are the actual reconciled tree relationships between these genes. And this shows that, at least in this particular snapshot, you know, about 30% of them had some kind of horizontal transfer that was inconsistent with the underlying uh, 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 Darwinian kind of tree. We're building this infrastructure in a distributed way. The bulk of the infrastructure is at Argonne, but there's machines at Berkeley, Oak Ridge, and Brookhaven, and uh, Cold Spring Harbor. Um, it's built on top of a cloud kind of infrastructure. Um, a couple years ago, uh, during the uh, stimulus funding, DOE put a bunch of money into a cloud testbed. We managed to extract it out of the cloud testbed mode and dedicate it to this project. So we have about 12,000 cores that's running uh, OpenStack, uh, which is an you know, open source, EC2 compatible uh, environment. Um, and we have this thing. Uh, replicated between Argonne and Oak Ridge and a, a cluster version of this uh, replicated between Berkeley and Brookhaven. It has about three petabytes of storage mounted on it. And this is sort of the computational framework in which um, these services are getting deployed. Um, we're deploying different families of it. This is our release schedule. We're sort of in this place right now. We'll be doing a beta release uh, next month. And uh, you know, if those of you interested in, in biology you should jump on board with this. Now, let me just spend the last couple of minutes talking about algorithms and tools a little bit and, um, and some uh, research challenges that might be interesting for some of you. So if I, if I cracked open this system, and, I, and I've you know, talked at a very high level about a lot of the biology uh, very superficially, but um, underneath uh, those boxes on many of these diagrams are tools. And much of what we've been doing in the last couple of years is not right, I mean, we do write new underlying tools, but finding ways of integrating this. There's about 100 computationally intensive kernels inside this environment, ranging from uh, statistical tools for cleaning up sequencing to assembly for doing things like uh, alignments uh, to uh, uh, KMER analysis, uh, multiple sequence alignments, spectral analysis, statistics, uh, machine learning methods, and so forth, evolutionary tree uh, reconstruction. If one really wanted to advance the state of the art here, one would need to understand, right, which of these algorithms are asymptotically optimal. Most of these are not because they're, um, they're heuristics and we don't, the underlying you know, algorithm is, is very, uh, has a very high complexity. Um, and so we're, we're moving from one heuristic to another. Um, let me just talk on three things and I'll be done I mean, in the last couple of minutes. So if you're young and you want to get into this field and you're an algorithms person, what should you do? I think you should work on one, of, one or all of these three problems. Okay. First one is alignment-free methods. One of the fundamental things that we compute all over and over again is the relationship between two sequences. Right? And historically, that's been done with alignment-based methods, quadratic complexity or worse. Um, and they're, we're running out of steam with those methods. We moved from pure quadratic methods to heuristic-based methods like BLAST, but the future is to move to alignment-free methods where you essentially use words or some kind of scale invariant representation of the sequence and compute properties between the sequences based on these uh, sequences. And this is uh, getting very interesting scaling where it can be used. It's being used in m more and more of the algorithms that we're interested in, and it can be easily uh, accelerated with hardware. So this is a, a really open area right now. Second area is computing directly on compressed data. Um, one of the more interesting results in the last two years 
Uh, it's a paper out of Ewan Bernie's group um, uh, in the UK uh, on a new data representation, uh, essentially compressing data against a reference sequence. M much sequencing today is resequencing to something that we already have a base sequence for. For example, sequencing a human, I sequence everybody in this room, right? I could store all of that data simply by picking one of you, I'll pick Alex, and then store everybody's sequence as a delta against Alex's sequence, right? Often we're doing that. If we do that correctly, we can get about a thousand to one compression ratio on this. But of course, it would be pointless to do that if we're constantly re-expanding it to actually do the statistics. So we want to have algorithms that work directly on that compressed data, and of course, ideally we want the algorithms, this kind of algorithms working on this kind of compressed data. And then finally, sequences are really not sequences. <laughs> so if we look at what happens when we actually do an assembly based on uh, short reads, what we get are graphs that look like this. We get regions where we can unambiguously construct contiguous regions, and these, these regions of, of, with no ambiguity are connected by regions of high ambiguity, either because they have repeats or because they're, they're complex in some other way. Ideally, what we'd want to do is actually keep the underlying graphical representation, graph representation of this going forward, right? So I chose these three problems because they're actually related. We want to shift the underlying output of assemblers to, to incorporate this. We then want to store everything we know about this sequence compressed relatively against that sequence, and then we want to move to a whole class of algorithms that actually don't do alignment, okay? And with that, I will thank you. There's some listens here, but those are, well, maybe I'll one more. The other big trend is that we're not doing any one thing at a time anymore. We want to ask questions about all the genes in an organism, all the organisms in a sample, right? All the proteins in a protein family, et cetera. This is pushing scaling. As things get cheaper, you ask these different kinds of questions, and the algorithms we need to do the analysis in this environment are actually quite different than the algorithms if you're just doing one. And finally, a couple years ago, some of you read this paper by Ross King in Science. Uh, he's in Wales, built an automated robot that essentially attacked a set of open genome function hypotheses in yeast, ran for a month, generated 14 uh, correct uh, predictions, or well, there were predictions and it validated uh, 14 correct predictions out of 20 of these new gene functions. This is what we need if we actually want to dramatically accelerate systems biology. We want to have the informatic systems and modeling systems directly connected up to large-scale robotics. Of course, we want to miniaturize this down to microfluidics so everybody can have these, you know, on your desk. Um, but this is what we need to do to actually uh, shift biology into the future. So with that, I thank you all.